Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Global Compliance Panel's live webinar on the DHF, DMR, DHR, Technical File Design Dossier, Key Requirements, and Future Directions. My name is Ricardo, and I'm going to be your host today. On behalf of our team, I would like to thank you for being part of this event. Today's webinar will be presented by Mr. John E. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln is a medical device and regulatory affairs consultant. He helps companies with CGMP compliance and US FDA responses. Such projects have passed FDA audit or submission scrutiny and have been described in peer-reviewed technical articles and workshops worldwide. John has over 28 years of experience in the FDA regulated industry, including 16 years as a full-time consultant working with startups to Fortune 100 companies. He is a graduate of UCLA. We are honored to have such a distinguished person such as John with us today to present this webinar. Before we begin, I would just like to inform all our attendees for the program that we have outlined for today's training session. This webinar is for 90 minutes duration. First, John would take you to today's webinar, highlighting the areas that would be covered, and he would then share with you his presentation. Uh, just to remind you, our attendees once again, uh, once part of the teleconference, you would notice you have been placed on mute and will remain so until the Q&A begins towards the end of the webinar. This is for the purpose of avoiding discontinuity and for allowing our presenter to speak clearly so that everyone present can take maximum benefit from this webinar. We also request our attendees to hold back your questions till the Q&A window begins. We have allotted about 10 to 15 minutes time during which your questions will be answered. Uh, just a reminder as well, if you do have any questions that come up during the presentation itself, do kindly take a note of your questions or else you could send your questions to me in the chat panel. I will gather up all the questions and we'll attend to each of those questions during the Q&A. Last reminder for our attendees, uh, just in case you happen to get logged out of the training session or the teleconference as well, uh, please do follow the same procedure to join back again. Now that we are ready to start, I request John to take it from here. Yes, and thank you, uh, Ricardo. Thank you all for attending. I'd like to reemphasize the point if I should get disconnected, uh, just stay on the line and usually within a couple minutes be reestablished. It doesn't happen very often, but it can. Uh, also want to reemphasize the importance of the Q&A. That's a chance for you to tailor this webinar, which is uh, obviously geared to a general um, population, uh, more specifically to your needs or your expectations when you signed up uh, to take it. Uh, if you think of something later on when you're involved in one of these projects, uh, please feel free to contact me through Global Compliance Panel or directly, and I will respond to those questions even months or years later. I've done that before, and I will continue to do it. If any of you ask a general interest question a day or so after the webinar, I will respond to that and forward it to Ricardo, and he will disseminate it to each and every one of you if it, if it is, like I mentioned, general interest. If you have specific uh, needs or uh, questions or assistance, of course, I am a consultant and always available that way as well. But uh, let's uh, discuss this. Uh, this is obviously a uh, topic of uh, much interest. And again, I reiterate, use the Q&A uh, function if I don't cover all the slides in the detail you would have preferred, because I, I won't. Uh, I've included more slides than I can give a lot of uh, discussion to to give you some background. And if you see a point on a slide that you want to ex explain that I didn't spend a lot of time on, make that part of the Q&A at the end. Now, we're talking about two uh, different uh, uh, regulatory uh, schemes here. We're talking about the US FDA and GMP requirements, and we're talking about the European Union or Common Markets uh, Medical Device Directive requirements. So we want to keep those points in mind, and I assume that's primarily the interest of uh, all the attendees to see the differences and the similarities. And for those of you that sell outside the US uh, and CE mark your product, uh, uh, some of the concerns you have as well as those perhaps outside the U.S. already CE marked and uh, selling product or desiring to sell product in the U.S. having to comply with the uh, CGMPs of the U.S. FDA. Uh, you're probably aware of some of the expectations and uh, points that we'll be discussing here. And again, uh, please uh, use the Q&A if any of these points were not discussed to the degree that you felt they should have been. Uh, it's a chance to get a little uh, 
extra consulting, so to speak, uh, certainly uh, a, a chance to tailor this or uh, bring it closer to your particular needs of those of your company. Now, when we're talking about the design history file, we're talking about FDA requirements under design control. That's 21 CFR 820. I assume the majority of you are medical device personnel. There's some minor points that might apply to uh, people in, in the pharmaceutical, dietary supplements, but the majority of this would be geared to devices, combination products, uh, that type of thing. So obviously, uh, you'd be interested in 21 CFR 820, and of course, uh, Dot 30 deals with uh, design control. We're going to get into that uh, in detail. But what is interesting is the design history file shows a development of a product basically from a start date, basically somewhere between research and development, all the way through to transfer of design to production for uh, produce <laughs> products for the marketplace. Really? So, this is an important distinction between the design history file and the technical file slash design dossier, which is a snapshot of a product at a point in time and should reflect the most current version, so it's updated accordingly. We'll talk uh, about both of these documents uh, later on, but uh, again, that's the key distinction between the two of them that we keep in mind. The DHF shows development over time, the tech file shows a snapshot in time, and that's what we basically sum up here. Now, the purpose of the design history file is to prove that you've met the design control requirements for the FDA, but it also has much greater use than that. Uh, those of you that have read books on fast cycle development appreciate the similarities between the points brought out in those books and the principles involved in the design control elements spelled out in 8. 20.30. Uh, it's an, and it gets in with my tagline that there's business success to be obtained from regulatory compliance. The technical file and design dossier shows the product at the time it's released to market and then it's updated whenever uh, changes are made to the product to reflect its current version. Whereas the design history file, in most cases, stops with the release to production and then Changes are handled through the device master record, the DMR, and we'll talk about that uh, later as well. But again, that's the important distinction between the two of them. Much of the material contained in both of them uh, is the same, although it's formatted differently, and there are specific formats called out by the medical device directive for the technical file slash the design dossier. So let's uh, spend a few minutes talking about the FDA's requirements here. The FDA requires under design control that you, uh, from the 1960s onward, 1966-67, uh, that, you, or excuse me, 96-97, uh, 1996-97, that you have a design history file on new products or substantially changed existing products. And this shows uh, how you met the design control requirements. The result of a completed design history file, the deliverables from that are what make up your device master record, the various components of that, such as uh, drawings, specifications of raw materials, components, sub-assemblies, uh, schematics, uh, uh, SOPs, etc. Uh, the device master record has, as part of its uh, uh, documentation, the uh, template for the device history record, which is your batch or lot record for the device, uh, each lot that's manufactured, as it's filled out, signed off, it shows that all the required steps were in fact done, including inspection steps, uh, as well as initial line clearance to make sure the production line was cleared of all uh, labeling and parts and components from our previous build. So uh, that's the uh, kind of the waterfall uh, chain uh, sequence between design history file, device master record, and the device history record. And we'll get into some minor discussion of those other two as we uh, progress. Now the requirements under the FDA's design control has to do with the fact that you prove that you did design planning, 
that uh, your design input is stated. This would be the requirements of the design. And that's a big element in any area, whether it be in validation, you list the requirements such as a DQ, for the, those of you that use that term, design qualification, uh, or software requirements spec if you're dealing with software. Uh, the FDA generally, when they do an audit, they look at the requirements you have for a validation and they compare those requirements to the actual test cases, uh, protocol elements that you did to prove that those things have been met. So in a design control exercise in the device history uh, uh, file, you're going to have a list of requirements, probably from your marketing people, management, including also the uh, applicable standards that have to be met, electrical standards, uh, other standards, including sterilization, uh, guidance documents from the FDA uh, that you should meet. Uh, or you have to have a good solid uh, rationale as to why you did something different. The uh, design changes. Uh, remember, design control means you're developing from a start date onward product that's under a change control environment. Now, whether you use the same change control system that your entire company uses for production product, or whether you have a prototype change control system, many large companies have something similar to that, it doesn't matter. The FDA doesn't care which method you use as long as once you define a start date, uh, from that point on, all design changes are under an approved change control system. That would include the software, if software is involved in the device or is the device, as well as uh, uh, hardware or deliverables, uh, uh, including disposables, etc. Design reviews. Uh, reading of the uh, 820.30 may imply one design review at the end, but basically, and again, this follows the fast cycle development uh, uh, model that's out in the field. Uh, I recommend, and you, when you look at the FDA's uh, website, you'll find that they basically expect to see design reviews held periodically throughout the, the progress of the product at key milestones. And uh, I would say those would be key gates, for example, under fast cycle development the approval of the past activities, and the release of uh, resources to the next stage in the activities. Uh, the FDA doesn't care so much about that, but they care that the design review uh, shows that your progress is according to uh, what you've spelled out in the plan and also uh, what is required uh, uh, per the uh, uh, changes that are going on. Uh, it should include an independent reviewer. Frequently, that's QA or could be an, even an outside reviewer or a consultant. Uh, design review uh, or verification and validation. Again, we have webinars just dealing with that, but uh, generally I define verification activities as inspection and test requirements and validation as a cumulative uh, uh, collection of all that information, including destructive testing. And we'll show you a, a slide that, that brings that out. Design transfer, in the old days, that was called throwing the product over the wall. In other words, it was developed by uh, th theoretical individuals, usually uh, engineers, and now it's given to production to build. Uh, in the modern day environment, generally there's uh, teams that uh, from the very beginning, uh, production, QA, uh, are involved knowing what's coming having their input as to what may be needed to take the pie-in-the-sky ideas, say, of R&D and marketing and make it realistic in terms of what the company can actually produce uh, safely and with high degree of quality. And all of this then is collected into a design history file. If some of the documentation is too big, or maybe some of the verification uh, validation packages are too big, you may want to include a 